Someone once said, each day you either get a little better or a little worse. The choice is up to you. While it may not be that simple, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves. Today, did I become a better parent, husband, friend, worker, runner, cook, and so on and so on and so on. When we think about getting better, we often think it means working harder or practicing more, and it may even feel and sound stressful. And while these are no doubt paths to improvement, they are not without their limitations. In Dave Edgar's insightful and often hilarious novel, Heroes of the Frontier, Josie, a mom of two, leaves the trappings of society behind to find meaning for herself and children by whisking them away to Alaska. Justifying her actions, she thinks, quote, raising children was not about perfecting them or preparing them for job placement. What a hollow goal. 22 years of struggle for what? Your child sits inside at an Ikea table staring into a screen while outside the sky changes, the sun rises and falls, hawks float like zeppelins. This was the common pursuit of all contemporary humankind. She would not subject her children to this. They would not seek these specious things. No, it was only about making them loved in a moment in the sun. In Josie's mind, becoming a better parent or raising better children starts with seeking out joy. Shortly after reading that passage, I was walking in a park, witnessing people becoming better at so many things. Skateboarders mastering a new trick, a runner going faster, and a group of 30 men demonstrating why soccer is called the beautiful game. While some might call what they were doing work or practice, most would refer to each as playing, and with play comes joy. If we truly want to become better in whatever we do, try to find the joy in it and play more. If the stress is too much to make this possible, perhaps a change is in order, although maybe not as drastic as a move to Alaska. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people of all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with Dave Eggers, the acclaimed author of 30 books and the co-founder of several nonprofit organizations, including 826 Valencia and Voice of Witness. We talked about how we connect with each other, the importance of telling our own stories, and amplifying the voices of others. I hope you enjoy. I wanted to start actually with a story I heard recently about you that, you know, I've always been a fan of your work, but became a real fan of, of you as a person when I heard this. And I was listening to another podcast, Smartless, and I guess a friend of yours, the writer Michael Lewis was on. And he told this, you know, really moving story about um, shortly after his daughter had tragically died in a car accident, that your immediate instinct was to be over there within an hour, insisting just on being present, whether he knew what he needed at that time or not. And he summarized, you know, you as a person as saying that you had a gift for being a human being and sort of noted that as something that was heroic. And then when I thought about, you know, your work, there's this through line of decency that I saw in it, you know, and I'm defining decent by sort of marked by moral integrity and kindness and goodwill. And I was wondering if you could just start by sharing a little bit of maybe what that means to you and what the idea of being a decent human being actually means these days. Your listeners missed us complaining about Zoom before we started officially. <laughs> and I think I'm a little bit of a Luddite. I considered myself an early adopter years ago with the Mac and stuff in the 80s and 90s. But I always wanted to, I just feel like you always have to put the human first. And you have to assume that humans in person are far superior to any other form of communication. I just feel like that's what everything else is a weak substitute. So I remember when, you know, in times of trouble for me and when my parents were sick, we experienced a lot of loss in a short amount of time as a family. And the people that were there in person, it always meant something to show up, I guess. And um, so I always uh, remembered that. So I think it's not like you always want to invade the private space of somebody you love who's going through something, but you want to be around, you want to be near. So mm. I guess sometimes 
in the case of Michael, I just parked around the corner. <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> be in, in his way, but I just, I used to live near where he lives and, you know, I know my way around there. And, uh, so I just said, I'll be around the corner if you need me. And, um, so I just stayed there <laughs> for the day and because, and I'll say this to anybody, like, especially young listeners, you, you just never know what's needed in those moments mm. and somebody to run some mundane errand or somebody to ward off an unwanted delivery or call or visitor or something, or just run interference here and there. There's so many things that I remember friends of my family doing for us way back when, and you don't really even recognize it at the time, but you realize that how much they were there and how much that meant and how much they eased your pain by just having, being a human there and actually a physical presence there. So that's a very long answer, but none of it's possible by Zoom. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, you know, it made me think of this idea of how we choose to connect. And I rem- I'm going to sort of badmouth uh, my family members a little bit here, but you know, I remember, you know, I'm born on Christmas, right? And huh. so, you know, I know everyone's busy and, and has stuff going on, but I remember just getting all in like a series of texts from family members. And I was like, is anyone going to pick up the phone? Yeah. <laughs> you know, is anyone going to call? And it seems as if increasingly we're more and more mediated and detached and think that that somehow that's the same. I find it really tragic, partly because your family members no doubt love you. And I don't think anyone mm. is so busy that they don't feel like they have time for you or anything. But it's just that we've been convinced that this is an adequate substitute for mm. a phone call. Yeah. And that's what's weird and I'm I'm I feel like in person always people are will always exceed your expectations. Strangers you meet any mm. day anywhere are so extraordinary and there's nothing that I love more than as a journalist meeting and interviewing somebody I've never met and just having them tell their story and I'm always have my expectations upended. I always find them a thousand times more fascinating than thinking and getting being inside my own skull i guess you know i would always rather listen to a new person and be introduced to their world and so but and i think that people do value that and i think that they get it and they think that they get nourishment from being in person and talking to and being around loved ones i just think that what's been lost i guess that willingness to to put in that time a little bit more frequently. I think yeah. the text is saying, I'm thinking about you, I love you, I'm gonna give you as long as it takes to write this text, <laughs> and then I'll see you, see you at Thanksgiving or something. And it, and it is, uh, I don't know, maybe we do have too much going on that we can't take that time, but it's not coming from anywhere but like a weird switch in the c- common sense of what's right. And I think that mm. everybody, whether it's within the last 18 months, everybody feels like every call has to be a Zoom call and or whether everybody thinks that a text is just as good as calling a loved one. We're all like a Borg, been collectively had our minds changed about something that was totally different two years ago, you know? And so I'm always fascinated by that just as a very slow adopter and as a skeptic, I'm always the last one to use these tools because I'm hoping a lot of them go away. (laughs) And so (laughs) I'm like, well, I'm not going to dive in because that's not going to be here. The CD-ROM went away and MySpace went away and a thousand other things went away, but then every so often one of these things sticks. So I am always waiting, but, but I'm always thinking like, well, how do we feel the best at the end of the day? How do we go to bed without feeling jittery and overwrought and overwhelmed and maybe depleted. And Mm. I think for a lot of people, a lot of young people I talk to, they feel that way, overwhelmed, overwrought. And it has to do with the drastically, exponentially increasing numbers of messages and inputs and responsibilities and pieces of information that they have to go through every day. It's uh, completely overwhelming to a young mind and an old mind. Yeah. I think that we've far exceeded the limits of what we can 
quote unquote process, I can't stand that word, but what we can <laughs> make our way through every day. It's far too much for a healthy mind. Yeah. You know, it reminds me when you said we don't question it. I don't know if you ever heard, I guess, heard, I think it was Kevin Kelly told the story once about how in the Amish community, they evaluate technology. And essentially, if someone wants to sort of introduce something, they bring it up. And if they think, okay, this is something to worth worth trying, they try it for an agreed period of time, and then they come back and they have to say, is this, has this been good for you? Has it been good for your family? Has it been good for your entire community? Wow. And only after that process do they actually then say, all right, do we keep it or not? Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense because they do take on some new technologies from time yeah. to time. And um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that Kevin Kelly would cite that. He you know, when we when I first got to San Francisco in 1992, he was working at Wired on the third floor of a building at South Park and Second Street, and we were on the first floor. And so I didn't get to know him well, but I saw him come and go, and he was kind of the philosopher king of the third floor. <laughs> and so mm. <laughs> it's been valuable to have his mind out there sort of thinking about these things all the all these decades. Yeah. I'll pivot a little bit to your book, The Every, because it... it touches on so much of this stuff. And, you know, it reminds me, it was, it, there's almost sort of like a boiling frog sort of, you know, I don't know if that metaphor is actually true or not, but if it, it's sort of consistent with that, this notion of things are introduced, we assume someone will question it, they don't, and then it becomes adopted. And I remember reading, I think maybe it was the cover blurb, it said it was hilarious and horrifying. And I remember it was actually in that order as I was reading it, really funny. And then, oh, this is getting really, really scary. And then, and then obviously the end, which I won't, uh, no spoiler alerts here, but decent people, many characters in the book who ultimately get co-opted by this belief in something that, you know, again, is sort of less human than just basic engagements. And you're centered right in, in, in San Francisco and, and, you know, maybe it's just the water that people swim in. And I've got friends who, who work in tech too. And it just, I'm always just surprised at the lack of cognitive dissonance that doesn't sort of stop and question things more often. And I'm wondering if this book that you were writing was based off of some of the experience of what you're seeing or conversations you were having, because the other thing too is really incredible is I think if I'm getting this right, I read somewhere that most of the technologies that are introduced in that are either in existence or easily, easily done. Yeah, I, I try to think of maybe five years ahead, I guess, to a worst case scenario that terrifies me and, and might horrify the reader. And then within minutes of the book being released, half the stuff I think I made up exists or has, is in the works. And so, <laughs> right. or something far worse appears. And so you can't really stay ahead of it for too long. But I try to make it funny because I think that we are a very silly species and we demonstrate it every day with how we adopt these technologies that make us crazy and we act like we can't do anything about it. And so we are very ripe for parody. And, but I think that, you know, for, for all of these things, there's two sides. There's the commercial and capitalist side, which I think we all understand very well. And we've always We've all lived and grown up in a capitalist society. It's a voracious shark that never stops moving and only has one thing on its mind, and, and that's to make more money. And so I think we understand that. There's a, there's a profit motive for profit-making companies to get our attention, keep our attention, keep us on phones and screens the same way that television networks tried to keep us watching TV. It's, it's not hard to understand. I think what's harder to understand is the not just the individuals who use in this technology because it's addictive and like any addictive substance, it's hard to resist for a lot of people. And so they make an addictive product and people get addicted. So the two things I think that are hard to understand is why there's no regulation or very little, almost uh, non-existent regulation in this country and very little around the world. And two, the motives and I think the complicity of some middle players and that's like institutions, whether it's governments, whether it's schools, whether it's colleges, their complicity in the spread and, and dominance of these technologies, whether it's a college requiring people to have a Google account to get their homework and, you know, which mm -hmm. most colleges do, which is incredible complicity and in, in a violation of trust and privacy for all of their 
uh, students in their care, to have a private, third-party, insecure, profit-making corporation in charge of all of their messaging. You know, they, they should, every college yeah. should have their own, or it should be a nonprofit, or it should be a government-run su- something that isn't clearly a violation of their trust with their students. Um, and then, you know, uh, boy, Bob, where did I, I, I forget where, what number, where, where I was with all of this. <laughs> I, like whenever you set yourself up and you say number one and number two, and then you get stuck. But I feel like the real, the real power rests in humans to say, well, that's enough of that for me, like your Amish mm. friends do. And it's also with, you have kids in school, I have kids in school, I wish that the schools did more to say enough screens. We're not going to assign homework on a screen. You don't have to use a screen to do your homework. You don't have to use a screen to turn it in. You're going to always have an analog option. And we're going to make sure that you have enough off-screen time, which every pediatrician recommends, so that you stay balanced and healthy and and aren't living a sedentary, screen-driven life. But I think too often these systems, government, schools, health, all of these th- systems that are supposed to be taking care of us and looking out for our best interests are forcing us onto screens more than we all know is healthy. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's uh, it's interesting how little challenged the technology is in the classroom at a time in which we are litigating so many books for what seem to be absurd reasons, right? Um, you know, if anything, there's, there's there needs to be more printed material, more books to engage in in the classroom instead of uh, censoring or banning in the way in which it uh, seems to be, you know, happening uh, for a variety of different reasons in too many communities. Yeah, well, I had a young person, teenager I know, say that they had not read really paper books last year outside Mm. of a few elective choices here and there, but most of their daily schoolwork was done on screens and in excerpts and uh, sort of digital textbooks. So the iPad was 99.9% of these, the year's schoolwork, and which is clearly unhealthy by any doctor's suggestions. It's wildly over the daily limit of recommended screen time. Yeah, I talked to my uh, daughter's ophthalmologist a couple of years ago, and he was talking about the, the rates of increase in nearsightedness. Oh, yeah. We're just through the roof. Oh, of course. Because they're getting to the screen so young, too. So it's yeah. uh, it's an eye strain from the very first cognitive moment, really, for some of these kids, eight months, a year, the first time that they can push the buttons and swipe, they, they're put on the screens, whether it's for uh, babysitting or, or for their academic work. But you know, the same student said, oh, their teacher this year was assigned, they took home a giant textbook, a history textbook, maybe 1,100 pages, a paper book, because the school had realized that the studies not only say that they shouldn't have so many screen, so much screen time, but that students absorb and retain more if they read on paper. So for so many reasons, I don't know why in the last two and a half years, what had been a pretty good system for maybe 500 or so years of reading books on paper had to be completely, you know, thrown to the sea. And again, I don't know if it's convenience or I don't know if it's just the hard sell that tech companies are are making for this, for their Chromebooks and iPads. But either way, schools and educators have a lot of power to say, nope, you're getting enough screen time after school, between classes, we're going in, in this class for this hour, we're going to give you something different. We're going to give yeah. you something that's proven. We're going to give you something healthy, which is like books on paper. And even if we're just doing it for the variety of experience, we should be doing it. You know, let's go outside. Let's read a book. Let's do some sculpture. Let's make a cabinet out of wood. Let's do something other than channel every aspect of life through a screen. You know, it's a... Uh... Interesting. I, I don't know what challenges you've had with uh, as, as a dad yourself, but I remember, you know, you, you get to a certain grade, kids are now walking to school, everyone feels like everyone needs a phone. And then, uh, you know, I remember I was passing around, you know, the, I don't know if you wait until eighth, if you've seen that sort of uh, initiative, which is like, don't give your kid a smartphone until at least eighth grade. Yeah. And I thought I had basically had all my friends in the bag to sort of like not do it. And yeah, if anything, collude. get a flip phone. And then my daughter comes back on the first day from eighth grade, you know, and she's like, you know, or to sixth grade or whatever it was. And she's like, daddy, everyone's got a flip or everyone's got a smartphone. I was like, yeah. oh, and so I, I don't know how, 
you know, I don't know if you've had success in your home, you know, with your daughter or kids or whatever. And so, but it's, to me, it's like, it's just, it becomes really hard when you're trying to sort of like tact in one direction when the whole world is going in another. Well, I, I see a lot of success with starting with a flip phone in whatever seventh grade or whenever you think you need one to get in touch with your kids. It makes sense. Yeah. You want to see where if they need to be picked up or whatever, but I don't think I, I think it's uh, disastrous to give smartphones to little kids. I just feel yeah. like it's it's <laughs> it's absolute madness, and I just have to say that with all candor, but with great empathy for all the parents and whatever pressure their kids put on them. But there's a lot of kid things that kids want that are unhealthy that we're in charge of keeping them away from. You know, whether it's cigarettes or drugs or, you know, like, or, or keeping TV time to a certain limit. Like we have power there. And so I think a reasonable conversation with kids, they get it. And yeah. I think that as we all know, some kids just push a boundary a little bit, but they're very content to be told no. Like they, right. as long as all of your reasoning is sound and you explain things and you can even explain the science to kids. Like, well, here's what it, the doctors say it does to your brain. Here's what it does right, to your right. attention span. Kids are so smart. They totally get it. Like, especially this, every successive generation is so, they're so aware, I think, of health, mental health. They they see their heroes, whether it's Naomi Osaka or whether it's Coco Gauff or US Opens on. So I'm talking yeah. about <laughs> tennis players. But yeah. these young athletes are so aware Tom Holland, you know, the Spider-Man guy, they're always, always talking about taking a break from social media. It's driving them crazy. Their mental health is um, at the limit. And so I think that smart kids are going to say, boy, these are people at the top of the world. And they're struggling with this because of these devices that and the input. It's far too much. What if I uh, turned off? Yeah. You know, there are so many young people I know that have voluntarily taken tech detoxes because it was too much for them. And, you know, when we were younger, it was a, maybe the worst that could happen to you, not the worst, but a bad thing would be somebody scrawling something about you on a bathroom wall that four people would see and then you wipe it off. <laughs> but obviously the way that, you know, bullying works now is uh, so much more permanent, so much more drastic, so much more horrifying that you could say something that could be visible to everybody in the globe about somebody. It could never be wiped in, off the digital realm. And so that's why kids are so, they think so catastrophically sometimes and the young people's mental health is so at risk. It's just so much more pressure than we had. And it is mm -hmm. because you're drinking from the fire hose at all times. These kids, it's not just like little sips and you know, your little world with your school and your town or whatever it is, you're always somehow engaged with everybody in the world that you have the ability to. And, and I feel like it's, it's far too much for if you're 10. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. It's far too much. And so we're there to protect, right? We're there to say, you're too young for this. You know, you're too young for this NC-17 movie. <laughs> you're too young <laughs> for hard liquor, you're too young for whatever it is. So yeah. we know when they're too young. So we just have to like step up and make these, you know, do things a little bit more gradually. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from the WNET group reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. Now back to the show. You know, the power of, of telling and owning your own story. And so if on one hand, we're just bombarded with all of this sort of external noise that we're trying to sort of digest. On the other hand, sometimes we don't have the space or the permission you know, at the youngest of ages to share our own story in a way that's, you know, authentic or vulnerable or, or things along those lines. And in your own case, I remember like a lot of people, I first came to, to know your work um, 
with your in- incredible book, a heartbreaking work of staggering genius, which broke so many conventions, which was really sort of powerful on a lot of us. Uh, to me personally, it was something where it sort of gave me the freedom to share and maybe in a way that I hadn't before, which you know I thought you know maybe was probably something a lot of readers got. And and I wonder if you could reflect upon either what that experience did for you with a, probably the most difficult part of your your life and and how important it is for us to give the space for anybody uh, to do that, especially uh, young folks or people who are, you know, marginalized in one way or another. Well, that was the, one of the main impetuses behind um, our nonprofit here, 826 Valencia. I uh, had seen, you know, helping with teacher friends of mine, you know, doing little writing workshops over the years and, and then working with the YMCA when I was in my twenties, like, there were always little, you know, experiences that I had and heard from my teacher friends about that shy student or that student that was hard to crack or that student that they knew was going through some difficult stuff at home, but they couldn't really reach or they just felt like they were losing track of the, these students that they couldn't break through. And and then you give them the opportunity to write their story, to put it all on paper and you say, it's not just make work. You're not just going to write it and I'm going to give you a B and hand it back to you. No, we're going to work on it. We're going to make it into a book or we're going to do a book of all of our stories in the class. You know, we're going to write letters to the president or we're going to write letters to our future selves or we're going to do oral histories of where our parents came from and the struggles that they went through to get to this country or to this city. And these larger projects were always so profound. Mm. And it wasn't just the kids that were natural, naturally uh, inclined to writing, but it was the kids that hadn't had that chance before, hadn't had the opportunity and maybe the platform where you say, no, you're gonna, we're going to work on this. We're going to write another draft. We're going to another draft. We're going to give you help with it. You're going to have a tutor. We're going to do f- five drafts, and then it's going to be copied, and then it's going to be illustrated, and it's going to be put in a hardcover book, all of these things that we try to do all the time at 826 Valencia, these things really, uh, they, they're always, there's always kids in every class that are totally changed by the experience because maybe they're not public speaking sorts of kids or they're not the ones that join the debate team or they're running for class president, but, or maybe they're new to this country and they really feel like they're at a disadvantage socioeconomically and the language barrier creates another barrier. But if you give them that chance one-on-one and you say, we're going to be here for three months while we work on this thing, it's not a just a quick write it down and turn it in and it's over. We're going to really be there. And, we're, and really what we want is to tell you to tell your story in a way that you think it's just perfect. We're going to make sure that nothing goes to press until you approve every word, every comma, every period, and you're going to get it right. It's going to be right on the page, just the way you want it. That's really a pivotal moment for a lot of kids when they see it in print. I remember it was that way. I had three different teachers that had us write books when we were kids in first grade and fifth grade and eighth grade. And um, I still have all three of these books. I remember every moment of those classes and it wasn't, and it was always really different than the daily assignment where you just write something quick, you turn it in. It was like that project. You're writing a project of getting yeah. your story down so that it's worthy of being put in a library or worthy at the very least of being lugged around for the rest of your life. Like I lug these books books around because it really captures your consciousness in a moment in time. And when you do get your story right and you get it down and you get it polished and you put it in order chaotic life that we all lead especially when you're 10 or 12 or 16 the chaos of your life and your emotions and trying to put your life in some kind of order and then you do and you get it right those kids there's a real difference in the before and after with a kid that just can't get it all straight it's just so much going on and it's so little in his or her, their control, now suddenly it's all in their control and their narrative yeah. is theirs and it's going to be published and it's going to be amplified and there's going to be people reading it and really getting to know the, the, the full and truth, 
grateful you because you took the time. All of those things are core to uh, the work that we do and now is done all by all kinds of other centers around the world that uh, sort of copy the model. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the, the idea of the stories worthy and you certainly don't have the depth of experience you have, but I volunteered both at, I'm just north of the city, so I volunteered in the Yonkers School District and then also teach at City College. So a lot of kids who are trying to get to college for the first time or sons and daughters of immigrants. And one of the things I find interesting in terms of helping them, whether it's in the class at City College, it's it's all about telling their sort of own personal economic story of their family and how they got to be where they are today. In Yonkers, it's about, you know, you need to tell a story for your college essay. And I'm always shocked at the starting point, which is often I don't have anything to say. Right. Or there's nothing worth it. And there was one, you know, I know that you're, you're also uh, an artist, so you'll appreciate this. There's one young woman who told this story. She didn't have anything she needed, you know, worth saying. She couldn't think of anything to write her essay about. And then she basically starts t- opening up a little bit and sharing a story about how she really liked to draw, but she was discouraged early from doing it. She didn't like it. She would just draw and throw everything away. And then finally someone told her that she did a nice job coloring inside the line. So she became encouraged to do more. And she ultimately got so good, she was selling some of her artwork online. Hmm. And here she was, she had an older Chinese father and she was taking care of him. And I said, what are you gonna do with the money? And she says, well, I'm, I'm gonna buy braces because like, we can't afford them. Hmm. And it just shocked me that it was like, you know, this is part of who you are and how you're expressing yourself and what you value. Yeah. And yet you're, you, there was a reticence to say that like, this isn't worth yeah. someone else hearing. And so this came out was with just the two of you talking. Yeah, talk over weeks. Yeah. And trying to figure it out and think this might be an area and what yeah. do you think and, you know, pulling it out. And it was in the case of some of these students, especially when I was at City College, the thing that was sort of wild about it is so much of what their experience in life was, they would obviously carry that into the classroom. Right. They've got a job or if they're helping pay some of the family expenses, that's going to affect how you show up to learn. And I would ask them, I said, well, do your instructors know any of that backstory. And they were like, no, it never it never comes up. And it, yeah. it, to me, it was very striking that the part of being able to tell your own story is to be able to show up in a room with some level of understanding about yeah. where you are relative to others and, and hopefully they can understand the same. Well, I, I would never, you know, 826 Valencia and our, we have a nonprofit called Scholar Match that's about college access. And the other related, you know, the sister centers to 826, we, we're all in support of public school educators and all teachers. And I would never tell them how to spend one hour of their day because I don't know. And uh, they're the ones that have the experience and the training and we're there to support them. I will say that I echo what you said is that, and I, and I do think that the teachers I know that start the, the school year with tell me your story are, seem to be, the classes seem more open, harmonious, cohesive, all of these things, because the students feel like the teacher knows as much about them as they should right away. Mm. And so yeah. this is different than my longer book project that I was talking about. But even if you do get a page down for the first classroom class and you spend the week, everybody getting to know each other, it's worth it, I bet, for the mm. rest of the year, just in terms of class connectivity, cohesion, I don't know, empathy, understanding, all of these things, especially when you're talking about just about every public school system has kids that are facing all kinds of interesting and difficult things at home. And so, but I have so many stories like that where, because we do we do something college essay writing weekend here at Mission mm-hmm. High School in the city where all the, any student that wants to get a weekend's worth of help one-on-one with advanced tutors to work on their college essays, mostly to the UC, University of California system or the CSU system, California State. And they need to write these three essays and they're usually starting from scratch. And we always start with talking, just like you did with your student. Tell me about it. And they always say, oh, no, there's nothing really interesting. <laughs> or they write some very bland essay that they think that the college board readers want to read. And then right under the surface, you find a story like the one you told. Or somebody's father's a mechanic in Iraq, you know, for, you know, right. a student I had was, he was taking care of his younger siblings and paying, uh, for daily expenses at the house because his dad was a mechanic for the army stationed in Iraq. 
and also, you know, his parents were undocumented. And I mean, it just went on and on. The number of stories that he had and responsibilities that he had at such a young age, at 17, and he was getting a 4.0 and starting on the soccer team. And he just was a fascinating, really just extraordinary kid that you'd was capable of anything. But he was about yeah. to write a very sort of reticent, bland essay because he didn't know what was so interesting about himself. And I think very often that third party, you know, in that third place, not home, not school, but this third place, sometimes those tutors, outsiders, new to you, don't know you that well, but are there to listen. They have an extraordinary place to, and role to play in bringing out those stories and saying that is fascinating. You should put that down. Trust me. No one's heard that before. Or trust me, the, the school is going to want someone like you on their campus. And then from there, once you talk it out, it writes itself. So much of yeah. writing is talking. Well, you know, it, it makes me wonder as we're having this conversation, like almost how did we get to this place? I mean, writing used to be something that was seemingly more accessible. I mean, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. I mean, if you've seen any like the Ken Burns documentary films of the Civil War and you hear these, you know, everyday soldiers writing these this beautiful prose, right? Well... Those that could write. Yeah, those that could write. That's right. We don't <laughs> That's have to, right. we can't overestimate. That's right. Yeah, I don't want to romanticize the past. That's right. Yeah, there's a higher percentage of readers and writers now than ever in the history That's of the right. world. Yeah. But yeah. those but that could write yeah. well, yeah, there were yeah, some right. good ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it makes me, like, even like, I don't know if we've both written children's books. And so I don't know if you've had this experience when you go into a classroom and it's always sort of neat when kids are like, oh, it's, you've published a book and stuff like that. But I always ask a question. I'm like, well, have you ever written a story? Have you drawn a picture? You know, well, then you're a writer. You yeah. know, have you made a copy of it and given it to someone? Well, then you've published it. And that right. sort of idea of accessibility and the, the, the act of writing something and putting your words and thoughts out there, I don't know if it's undervalued, but it is one of those things that I fear you know, maybe we don't lift up enough and maybe that's some of the reticence to say, you know, where people are, I don't have a story to tell. Well, you also remember that teachers have been under this one, you know, set of pressures after another. And for mm. the last 20 years, starting with Bush, there was no child left behind that created this monstrous test obsessed right. culture. And we've been, you know, we've been dealing with that for well before Bush too, that, the powers that be in DC and state governments, they want to just be able to look at a spreadsheet quickly and see, you know, there's some na big national test that came right. out yesterday that we're supposed to think is definitive and uh, it's anything but because these standardized tests are, if you've ever looked at them as an adult, you cannot believe what thin gruel they are. Like they are so <laughs> specious. And right. now when the tests are done digitally, which they mostly are, this software is unbelievably, laughably terrible. And the machines that they often, I mean, the students I know are always talking about, well, you know, our Chromebooks didn't work for 45 minutes, so we didn't do the test. We didn't have enough time. Right. To, I mean, we couldn't hear the audio. The audio, I mean, all of these different things that get in the way of really knowing what a student knows and uh, being able to properly assess them. But this is just to say that I think if it were up to most English teachers, they would have that time to tell stories and write stories and have the kids write their own stories. And But there's so much pressure to teach to the test. And yeah. what, depending on your district and, and, and what your administration wants and what, what test scores are considered good that year and compared to those in South Korea, whatever it is, we're, we're very rarely able to assess what truly matters, I think. Yeah. I think when it comes to math stuff, I'm gonna put that aside and say, that's somebody else's, I don't know what we yeah. can assess for math because I'm not good at math. But I do know that the assessments I've seen for the most part that are there to assess what students can do on the page and what they understand from what they read are all laughably bad. They are atrocious and I've gone through them and I, I've studied, especially increasingly, they're using AI to assess student writing and student reading comprehension, which is a crime against humanity mm. and a real human rights issue that I hope we turn back from it. But again, it's this obsession with being able to look very quickly at a spreadsheet and say, good, bad, as opposed to right. really delving in 
to the infinite complexity of every kid and saying, you know what, it's gonna, it would be a few weeks to really figure out if this student right. is where we think they are, whether or not the teachers know, yeah. but these tests aren't gonna reflect it the same way that the teachers know. And so I think the solution to so many issues is let teachers teach, give them the power, make the job attractive, make it something that a teacher can see themselves doing for 20, 30, 40 years. Make them master teachers, as opposed to this endless revolving door where most half teachers leave within five years because they cannot afford to teach and they can't stand the constraints. And now more than ever, with these transparency laws where teachers are have to, they're not allowed to say certain words unless they get approval to do them. They have to tell parents everything that they're going to do over the course of the year. They can't mention LGBTQ issues. They can't talk about critical race theory. They can't talk about this. They can't, you know, that's why we have a teacher shortage nationwide. That's why teachers are fleeing en masse. We are so good at making the world's most important job the hardest job. And I do not know why we do this, because if we supposedly love and care about our children and value education, Teachers should be exalted, should be paid three times what they're paid, and we should be holding tight to make sure that they stay in the profession and reach a mastery that would benefit all of our students. Instead, we make the job abominably difficult, annoying, constrained, and uh, unattractive. And so, yeah. anyway, that's my little soapbox. Well, yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm with you. I've got friends who teach who would, who would echo all of those sentiments. And, and also from the perspective of the students, I mean, it's like we've sucked the joy out of learning for yeah. all parties involved. And, for all parties involved. That's the way, yeah. because if the teachers yeah. don't feel free and creative, yeah. it's going to trickle down. Yeah. It reminds me, you know, I think uh, I love to collect things, you know, I think artifacts are interesting. I always like, you know, anything my kids write in school, I like to keep, I keep stuff I wrote from you know, all my education. And when you think about sort of the artifacts that we'll have 20 years from now from school, not to get too somber and, and depressing about it, but I was going, doing back to school shopping recently with my kids and they, and they, they love to just get supplies. They like to get paper and pencils and that's great. And all of a sudden I was in, it's a fun experience normally. And I was, and they were like, oh, I need a new book bag, a book bag. And I look and I see something, I I stopped in my tracks and I was like, I can't believe as a society, this is what I'm looking at. And it was a bulletproof backpack. Oh no. And I was just like, I was like, this is an artifact of the time we live in. Yeah. And what's, what happened and the way we think about what we should be doing for, you know, for children in a school, it was so disturbing. I couldn't, it took me a while to get over it, you know, and get back in the moment with my kids. Yeah. I didn't know there was such a thing, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Not, not only, not only is there such a thing, but as you can probably predict, sales are through the roof uh, and it happens uh, every single time there's something in a school, a school shooting where that, uh, you know, they, they rise even more. There's nothing I can't even, I mean, I, I think about it every day. I have no I would just echo the hundreds of millions of people that find this outrageous and irrational. And more than anything, I mean, I did a lot of research into the NRA and I was trying to figure out how many members they actually had, right? And so at best, they have maybe 5 million members. That's their own number to boast what their membership. Right. And I would say a fraction of those people are real active members that are engaging. Um, this is a country of what, 325 million people. Right. So this, we are talking about an absolutely tiny, tiny, negligible fraction uh, percentage of our population that is allowed to create this culture where every student has to live in terror. And it is uh, so galling mm. that politicians on both sides, and really both sides, are so cowed by this supposed awesome power of these five million people. And not just, and I don't think that the five million want things this way either. I think that they pay their dues and then the gun companies pay the rest. And um, this is a lobbying arm arm for gun manufacturers to sell more guns. That's it. I think a very, very small fraction of the NRA wants their children to grow up in a culture of an abject terror right. and where every year a certain number of students have to be sacrificed on the altar of this completely irrational 
interpretation of the Second Amendment. But I think that politicians have infinitely more power than they think they do. If they all tomorrow said, you know what, we're just going to, AR-15s, we're going to get rid of these, period. They're weapons of war. We're going to start there. And then we're going to talk more about other things. But this has to go. High magazine, high capacity magazines, no. They are for soldiers to protect our our uh, interests, you know, in the world and make us safe. They're not for hobbyists killing varmints. Right. You know, it, it's irrational. Yeah, It's yeah, just yeah. irrational. So let's like agree on certain basic things and at least get within the realm that we're not the laughing stock of the world and also where our children can grow up with some semblance of safety. Yeah. So I want to try to end with the, you know, two questions. The first one, if nothing else, a very a prolific writer who cares deeply about the topics you write on. Almost everything you write is tied into some kind of social issue that is important to us. And recently I, I finished reading uh, your, your book, Museum of Rain. And part of that is about what we leave behind, what we create, what we make, how people build on it. It's like sort of a, a little bit about legacy. And then I went to your site today and I just looked at all of these projects you've done. It's interesting if you go to your website, the thing you'll notice is you're seeing all this stuff and you don't even get to your books until the bottom. You know, you're seeing everything about 826 Valencia, about the scholarship, mat, scholar match, the program you mentioned earlier, some of the other foundations that were started that came on the heels of your book. And, and I wonder, how do you square your desire to write and to make a difference and not to get sort of wallow in despair. I mean, obviously there's a lot of satire and humor in, in so much of your work, but um, I do believe there's a, there's a great deal of hope in it as well. And so how, is it is it just that this is the way in which you can make a difference and so you, you feel good about what you can do and at the end of the day, this is your museum of rain and you're gonna feel good about what you've been able to do or how do you balance that? Well, I wrote that story not really knowing what it was about, I guess, and mm. I think that well, a lot of the best stories are that come out of you from some other place, some subliminal place, and then you don't realize until later what you just wrote or what the deeper meaning is. And yeah, I think my favorite thing is when you can start something. You know, 86 Valencia just had its 20th anniversary last weekend. You know, we celebrated it last weekend. We've been celebrating it for about a year and a half. But anyway, we celebrated it again last weekend with the block party. And I don't have any daily duties there any these days. I help out when I'm asked and I help fundraise when I'm asked and I tutor when I can and I help the new centers like in Louisville or Toowoomba, Australia, which just started up recently. And um, wherever it is, uh, if they want me there, I'll be there. Otherwise, I know that they can do things better than I can do them. But to see all of these young staffers who are maybe the average age is 28 or something, sort of take over and sort of talk about the program from the stage and have young readers read their work from the stage and run all of these different workshops in the street fair that we had. And that's my favorite thing in the world because mm -hmm. it appeals to the lazy side of me, which would rather enjoy the street fair than work at it. And so, but also <laughs> I know that I might be good at coming up with an idea every so often, but there's a lot of people that are infinitely better at running things. And the closer, so many of these staffers, you know, were in high school five years ago, you know, or, yeah. or six, you know, they know really what's going on in education. They know how to communicate, you know, how, how students might be best get through it. And if they, if a lot, you know, a lot of our staffers were born in other countries or a couple of our, we have board members that were undocumented, you know, originally and grew up that way. And they understand what a lot of our students are going through better than I can. And the older I get, I know my limitations in terms of being able to sort of know what's going on yesterday in the school right. system. And so, so my favorite thing is to see how people interpret an idea and carry the torch and make it better. And that's what happened, you know, the other day. And that's what's happening in our center every day. I mean, there's a, our executive director, Bita Nazarian, opened two new centers. You know, we had this one center in the Mission. She opened another in Mission Bay, a new neighborhood, and, uh, and another center in the Tenderloin. And she's growing this program that we started. She's growing it by leaps and bounds and doing things that we never dreamed possible. And so that is the real joy, I think, when you can yeah. sort of give birth to something, hand it off, see it grow, 
wave and smile from a certain distance and see yeah. how it's interpreted and and expanded. No, well, I can imagine also sort of a, it's a constant and you know I should say easy, but it's a it's a very accessible sort of thing to tap into to keep getting fuel in the tank to keep going and trying to to put new stuff out into the world. Yeah. Yeah. Much like you did with playing with some of the conventions in your memoir and the acknowledgements. At the end of each podcast, I seed the credits over to the guest to give them an opportunity to thank some people who helped get them where they are today. And, you know, I know that your list may be infinitely long, but people may not even know the names you'd reference. But I wonder if you wanted to take a few minutes and just thank anybody who's expanded some of the stuff you've done or helped you, you know, you mentioned some writing teachers earlier on. I just love the idea of hearing names of people who have helped others. I'm thinking of my journalism days at the University of Illinois, and there's a few people that I haven't thanked properly. One was Kit Donahue, who was sort of the, uh, and Kathy Roman, who were the sort of the adults at the daily newspaper that we worked at. Um, <laughs> it was a real job and a real paper that came out every day and yeah. we got paid to work there. And those were the two sort of steady hands that kind of helped mentor all of us young editors that came through. And I think that they're, you know, both retiring soon. So the, they were incredibly stabilizing forces. And I've stayed in touch with Kit, you know, for 30 years since. And one of my teachers who's who sent me a book of his, he was a illustrator, Carlos Aguirre, who was like a professor there for a few years when I was there. And he was he would be teaching us, and then he'd say, "I got to go after class because I've got uh, I've got a an illustration due for the New York Times op-ed page for tomorrow." And he would be <laughs> this was the fax day, so he would draw something or do a lino cut, and then fax it to the Times, and it would be in the paper the next day. And as somebody that always sort of toggled between the visual arts and writing, he was a real inspiration to me that he was a working teacher. You know, that mm. he was kind of inspiring us by being, having one foot in both worlds. And um, he's still out there and he's has a recent book out of his retrospective of his work. And he was an incredible sort of teaching by leading, teaching by example sort of force in my life back then. But the University of Illinois, you can't do better as for a journalism education. That's awesome. Well, hey, Dave, thanks so much. I could talk to you about a thousand other topics. I appreciate you making the time and coming on and wish you the best of luck with uh, whatever you write next. I'm sure I will get it. And thanks for all the joy you've given me with uh, the stuff I've read and the way you've provoked uh, some thought in my mind and, and those of so many others. Thanks so much, Bob. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know. <laughs>